So in predictive analytics, we use a fairly innovative technique to build models and test our models. Okay, and this whole process is called supervised learning. Okay, this is an important idea. This is this idea underlies much of what we'll do in the course, so you should pay a lot of attention to this concept. Okay, so let's say we have our historical data for something. You know, don't worry about the actual attributes and so on. This is obviously a, a simplified example of our real data. Okay, so we have our target attribute, which is ownership, and we have two predictor attributes, but typically there'll be lots. Okay, so what we'll try to do is, let's say we have 5,000 rows of data. Okay, or, you know, 50,000 rows of historical data. Now, in order to build our model to predict ownership based on income and education, we will not use all the 50,000 rows of data to predict, to build a model. Instead, we'll partition the data into two parts, right? So let's say we put away 15,000 rows of data. Just put it, put it, randomly select 15,000 rows, put them away, right? So we now have only 35,000 rows and we'll do our model building on the 35,000 rows of data, okay? So on the, using the 35 rows of 35,000 rows of data, we'll build a predictive model to be able to predict ownership based on the other attributes, okay? Then the remaining 15,000 rows of data, we'll treat that as a test partition, okay? So we'll build the model and then we'll try to use the model to make predictions on the test partition, okay? Now remember, this is historical data. So we have the value of ownership for all the 50,000 rows, okay? But we deliberately put away 15,000 rows. We built our model based only on 35,000 rows. Now we can apply the model to the remaining 15,000 rows, and then we can see the discrepancies between the model predictions and the real class to which every row belongs, okay? Now, if the model does well on this, we say, well, good, the model took some data that it was not built at all upon, it took some completely new independent data, and it still performed very well. So we can have faith in the model. On the other hand, if it turns out that the model doesn't do well on the test data, then you say, well, it's not a good model, okay? But of course, we have to be careful what we mean when we say not a good model and not a bad model. How much can we expect, okay? So this process is called supervised learning, and uh, this process of dividing the data into training partition and test partition, it's called partitioning of data. It plays a very central role in predictive analytics. Can you imagine why this process is actually called as supervised learning? Well, it's called a supervised learning because consider the, the training partition, right? In, we are using the training partition to build the model. Okay, now in the training partition, we have the values for the predictor attributes and we also have the values for the target attribute, which is whether each of these people purchased a car or not. Okay, now the model building process is looking at the values of the, you know, outcome variable or target attribute, right? And then using that to build the model. That is, it's able to say, well, a person with so much income and so much education bought the car. A person with this much income and this much education did not buy the car. Right? And it's able to look at this and say, oh, maybe it looks like people with high incomes and um, moderate education buy the car, etc. whatever it is, right? So the, the data that's available in the whole data set in the training partition is helping us to build the model. It is telling us that uh, you know, the, the correct values in the training partition are guiding our model building process. It's like there's a teacher telling us, oh, you know, this is more correct than that the teacher being the correct values of the uh, target attribute, right? So that teacher is supervising our process of learning, right? If we had no idea about, you know, who buys a car and who doesn't buy a car, then we cannot seriously build a model to predict who will buy a car. At least we can build a model, but it won't be guided by the correct values which are available in our data. That's why it's called supervised learning, okay? The correct values are supervising our process of model building. Okay, uh, so let's take a look at this in slightly closer, uh, we'll take a slightly closer look at it. So we've got our training partition. Okay, and on the training partition, this is the data. 
right? We've got values for all the attributes, okay? Uh, of course, we will ignore the household number. That's just a numeric, you know, just a sequence number. It doesn't play any role, okay? So based on that, you know, these are the attributes, okay? So based on the training partition, somebody built a model to classify whether somebody will buy a car or not. I've written luxury car here. Perhaps we were talking about sports car, doesn't matter, right? So whether somebody is going to buy a car or not, we'll build a model to predict this, okay? But of course, you know, the correct values are already available in the training partition. And the availability of the correct values is what helps the model building process to say, okay, under these conditions, they buy, under those conditions, they don't buy, or whatever the model is. Okay, so based on that data, we'll build the model. And of course, we haven't yet talked in this course about how we are going to build this model. That's the subject of, you know, that's the meat of this course where we'll learn uh, several techniques to build such models. So for now, we just assume that there's some way by which we can build a model to use, uh, you know, to use this data and to predict whether somebody will buy the car or not. Okay, so we've built a model. Now, we've got our test partition, the data that we just put away initially. We completely kept that data away. We never used that in, in model building at all. In that sense, the data in the test partition is independent data. Independent in the sense that it's pure. It, you know, the, the model building process was not influenced by that data at all. Okay, and of course, because it's part of the original data, we still have available the correct answers for each of the cases. You know, somebody had um, an income of $65,000 per year, and their education level was they had a graduate education and it turned out that they were not an owner. We know that. But now, since we've built a model, we can apply the model and see what the model says for this particular case, right? If a person has a, a income of 65,000, they have graduate education, what does our model say they'll do? Will they buy or will they not buy? Similarly, for this person with a $68,000 income and a high school education, the person is actually an owner of a luxury car or a sports car, but what does our model say, right? So now we have the opportunity to compare what the model says versus reality, okay? So now having done that, how might we measure the quality of the model numerically? It's pretty straightforward, right? So we've got the reality of for each case, and then we've got what the model predicted for each case. If it's a good model, then obviously these two would be very close, right? The reality and what the model predicted would match pretty closely. Of course, we can never expect a 100% correct model, right? We'll get some extent of match between the two. Now you might say, what is a good level of match? Does it have to be 80% correct, 70% correct, 50% correct? That completely depends on the context. Right. It might be the case that you have a 10% improvement in, uh, you know, without the model, what you could predict and with the model, what you could predict. The model is improving your ability to predict by 10%. That might be a big deal in some cases. In some other cases, you may need an 80% improvement. Okay. So it depends upon what you stand to gain by this incremental improvement that the model provides. Again, we'll see examples of this later on. Okay. So in this, this example, how might you measure the quality of the model numerically? In other words, I want to put a number on the quality of the model. Well, one thing we could do is to see the percentage of correct classifications. In other words, if we jump back to the screen, okay, uh, let's say there are a thousand cases in our test partition. Out of the thousand cases, how many cases does the model get correct? Or alternately, we could say, what is the percentage of cases in the test partition that the model is able to correctly classify? Okay, so that could be one way we could look at it. So we could say, well, the model is correctly classifying 80% of the cases. Okay, so that's one way of looking. Of course, we always have to look at this in the context of without a model, without a serious data analytics model, what, how many cases could you have got correctly? Right? Suppose it turns out that without a model, you could get 60% of the cases correctly. But with the model, you're able to get 80% of the cases correctly. Right? So the model is giving you that extra 20% bump. Okay? So that is the benefit of the model. So you may try, try to translate this into monetary terms. You may say, okay, what does that extra 20% mean for us in terms of money? 
Okay, and then you may say, well, this is the cost of the model. This is the benefit the model brings, and therefore, you know, how good is it? Okay, so one would be just to look at the total percentage of correct classifications, but sometimes we are interested more in the correct classifications of one class than the other class. In other words, let's say out of all the buyers, that is people who actually buy the product, the model is able to get 90% of them correctly. In other words, it classifies 90% of actual buyers as buyers, right? Only 10% of them, of the buyers, it says are non-buyers. In other words, we might be interested in the mistakes or correctness of the model on each individual class. And we may say, well, we are more interested in predicting people who buy the product correctly rather than predicting people who don't buy the product because we tend to make money when people buy our product, right? So we may be willing to take a bigger risk, a greater uh, you know, risk in, in that category, okay? In other words, we want more correct performance on that, but of course, it will come at the cost of performance on the other category. We may say, well, I'll sacrifice a little bit of performance on the non-buyers to be able to get a better performance on the buyers. Okay, so that's the idea uh, here. Or alternately, uh, you know, in this case, we might be interested in uh, classification of non-owners, non-buyers. Okay, so these are all ways by which you might measure model quality. Later on, when we talk about classification, we'll get a closer look at these ways of looking at model performance.